Oh man, what a show we have for you today because no one's going to tune out of this because from a marketing perspective, it's kind of a genius thing to be involved in is happiness. Who doesn't want to be happy? Now, it's funny, I've got 11 and 12 year old daughters and I, I go, oh, we've got this incredible guy on today and he's going to talk about happiness. And he teaches one of the, he taught one of the largest classes at Harvard on happiness and being 11 and 12 year old girls, they said, well, who isn't happy? And then they go, <laughs> they said, and then the older one goes, well, I could teach that, a class on happiness. And I started laughing. I go, well, only time will tell. But it was actually really revealing to me that I think most of us are born inherently happy. And then over time, we start to take on stuff that, that makes us unhappy. So couldn't be happier to have you on here, Dr. Tal Ben Sahar. So thank you so much for joining us here today. So that's kind of a good jumping off point is one, are we born sort of happy and over time does this become something that we have to deal with and so i'll start off with the big big high level question how do we become happier wow uh, thank you eric for for having me here and please thank your daughters for uh, this wonderful introduction <laughs> um and yes to a great extent they're right you know a lot of the things that we teach in a in a class on happiness um we know, we know inherently, or our grandmother told us, and 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 people ask, so, so why do we need a, a class on the science of of well being? Is just just making things more complicated than they need to be? And the answer is because sometimes we're wrong, and sometimes uh, society creates uh, certain uh, seeming truths which are absolutely false, and we're misled. So the science of happiness is necessary to bring us back to the, well, I was going to say straight and narrow, but it's not so narrow. And, uh, and, and it's also not so straight when I think about it. Um, but we also need it to remind us of what we already know, such as to be grateful and appreciative, such as to move around. You know, as kids, we run around a lot. And, and, then, and then we sit down in front of our computer and spend the rest of our lives there. Uh, such as uh, to be kind and generous and allow ourselves to laugh and to cry, which kids do naturally, but we don't. Interesting. No, very fascinating. And you've written more than a couple of books and happier and, and being happy have been translated into 30 languages. Uh, it's incredible. One thing I've always wrestled with and is a common question is what in your mind, what's the difference between joy and happiness? Yeah, so that you know, that's a matter of uh, uh, personal preference and definition. My definition of joy is that it's more momentary, that it's more about emotions, and that happiness includes joy in it and many other things, such as a sense of meaning and purpose, such as uh, the mind-body connection and physical health, such as intellectual exploration and, and learning and curiosity. Uh, for other people, it's the opposite. They see happiness as a you know momentary experience of uh, positive emotions and joy, is something which is broader than that. Uh, it's important to define it, to explain it, and then most importantly to ask: so what can I do to increase that which I want? Be it joy and or happiness. That's good. And and for us out there, what are some common? So you're at Harvard teaching one of the largest. You know, you taught one of the largest classes in the history of Harvard, which is amazing um, when you think about that. And you'd think inherently that people at Harvard would be happy that they're successful. They're at the top of the pyramid, that they got into Harvard. Uh, but actually, sort of the opposite sometimes true. And, and why is that? And just kind of, if you can kind of peel back the onion a little bit on, on how that works, where people from the outside would be like, well, you're going to Harvard. How can you not be happy? Yeah. So I want to go back to uh, our uh, earlier uh, conversation about your daughters. You know, your daughters didn't really care which kindergarten they, they, they got into and whether it was a prestigious one or not. And yet our society does. And we learn, um, unfortunately learn, that um, what's important for happiness is prestige and accolades and being uh, um, and getting into that top school or that top job or having this amazing house. You know, children born in a palace are no happier than children born in a, in, a, in, a, in a humble abode. 
And yet over time, we learn these things and we need to unlearn them because getting into Harvard or living in a mansion or driving, you know, the most uh, um, expensive and, and fast and beautiful car, these are not the things that will make us happy or happier. Um, what will make us happy or happier are the kind of relationships that we cultivate. It's the time we spend uh, appreciating what we have. It's, you know, moving and being active. These are the things that make us happy and we need to unlearn uh, a lot of it. And a misunderstanding, a significant misunderstanding in the West, but increasingly so throughout the world, is that the job you get or the university you get into is what will determine your levels of happiness. It won't. No, that's well said. It's almost like you said, you've got to unlearn these things. And it's almost like that old parable of the fisherman where he's happily content fishing with his son. And then someone from the Western world comes down and says, hey, you know, you could, you should catch more fish. You're really good at this. You should start a business. And he's like, sure, well, okay. And then and what? Well, then you could buy more boats. Okay, if I catch more fish, then I can sell them and buy more boats. And then, and then, and then when we buy more boats, well then, then you can have this company and, and, and then you can start to can the fish and start to do this and become this huge conglomerate. And, and he goes, well, how long is that going to take? He's like 10 or 20 years. And, the, and then he goes, well, what's, what's it after that? He goes, that's the best part is once you build this thing, then you do whatever you want. What is it you want to do? And he goes, well, I just want to fish with my son. So he's already at the place to where this guy from the Western world was trying to get him to in 20 years. He was already at that particular spot. And, and then uh, Erica, you know, I want to say something about this story because it's a very important story. Um, and the, uh, the message in this story is not that we should all go and fish with our, you know, with our loved ones. The message here is that we should all go and do what we love to do. And if we love to fish with our loved ones, great. If we love to build a business and create a conglomerate, then that is what we ought to pursue. Pursue your passions. I love that. Yeah, you define your success and then you pursue that. And it's different for everyone. Um, no, I, I really like that. So success is kind of different on how we define it for everybody. That's a key to happiness. What are some of the other keys out there for those listeners out there? And, and, and for the most part, most of the time they might be happy. Like for most of the, I'm usually happy, but there's days when I wake up and I realize, why don't I want to get out of bed? Why, why am I not just leaping out of bed? There's some days when I'm on a new project, I can't wait to get up. And other days I'm kind of sitting there in the bed, just not wanting to get up. You know, building on what you said, the first step to happiness is allowing in unhappiness. Meaning if, you get up in the morning and you don't feel like, you know, working or you're just sad for whatever reason. And you say to yourself, you know, I shouldn't be sad or, uh, you know, I should, you know, want this more or any other should. That unhappiness will actually increase. It's paradoxically when we accept and embrace the unhappiness, when we give ourselves the permission to be human, that is when we're in the best position to actually become happier. So the first step to happiness is allowing in whatever, whatever painful emotion uh, finds its way into our, into our being. And then after accepting and embracing any and all emotions, we should ask, what is it that provides us with, uh, with uh, the most uh, happiness? Is it uh, spending time with, with family? Is it spending three hours or is it spending, you know, half an hour because, you know, we're all different and, and, and we should cater to our particular, not universal, particular needs. Um, be, being physically active, extremely important, not just for uh, physical health, also for mental health. Hmm. Um, learning and curiosity. And again, not learning and having you know curiosity about a particular topic. It could be about whales and it could be about uh, uh, Sanskrit but finding what it is that you enjoy learning and studying and then indulging in it, also an important part of happiness. Now that's super helpful. It's like you said, it's almost counterintuitive that if I'm laying in bed and I go, gosh, why am I unhappy? I shouldn't be unhappy or why am I not leaping out of bed? Just understanding that's just part of the cycle and sort of embrace it as the way to get through it. And it's interesting because I don't know if this is the right metaphor, but I, yesterday I was speaking in Los Angeles and they had another person from the company that was going to speak, just a young 28-year-old that got tabbed to speak on behalf of the company. And he was literally having a very big panic attack. 
And I was telling him, look, you're supposed to be nervous. I'm going to be nervous in a second here, but just embrace those nerves and turn, turn into energy. And so when you said that, I was like, wow, that's almost similar to what I was coaching that kid to avoid that panic attack. You're saying the same thing to us out there. You know, you've got to embrace that. That's part of the cycle. And then kind of that's how you get through it. That's really, really, really helpful. And, you know, Eric, in, in such situations, the right advice is not, oh, you're nervous, be calm. Because, you know, I can't just turn the calm on. Yeah. Um, however, to embrace the anxiety and then turn this into excitement or other form of energy, that is very doable. That is, uh, that is realistic. The key is to accept and embrace whatever emotion. Why? Because you see, there are no good or bad emotions. Emotions are experiences. You know, mm. we don't always invite them on and they don't always ask us when, when, when they come on. Um, and if we accept and embrace them, then we're in a much, much better position to work with them rather than against them. I love that. Embrace it. And you're right. The people around this guy that's having a panic attack, they're saying, just be calm. There's no need to be nervous. And and, I, and then I come in like the speaker and say, yeah, yeah, you should be nervous. I want to be nervous. It's okay. You know? And so it's counterintuitive to what you'd think. So that's, that's fantastic. What about thinking about an old school chalkboard, like nails to a chalkboard. Some of our younger listeners don't even know these blackboards, but you put your nails on it. It makes a terrible noise. But what, in your experience, when someone hears what you do and they go, oh, and it could be at a cocktail party. It could be an interview like this to where they go, oh, this is what you do. What do they get wrong most of the time? Yeah, so one of the things that most people get wrong about when we talk about happiness is that they equate happiness with positive emotions or positive thinking. And, um, you know, happiness is much more than that. Um, you know, the, the ex again, the expectation that a happy life means a life devoid of painful emotions, it's not only unrealistic, it's also counterproductive because that's when we pit ourselves up against uh, our emotions instead of giving ourselves the permission to be human. So happiness also includes painful uh, experiences, difficulties, and hardships. Moreover, happiness also includes a sense of meaning and purpose. It's not just about, oh, I, I, I was on the beach, I was so happy, or I was having this ice cream, it made me so happy. It contributed to your pleasure, but that's just a small part of happiness. Uh, happiness is about relationships. Happiness is about kindness and generosity. You know, it's not just about, you know, the me, me, me approach. Far from it. In fact, the number one predictor of happiness is uh, quality time we spend with people we care about and who care about us. One of the most powerful interventions for increasing happiness is committing to acts of kindness towards others. So looking at happiness as a multi-dimensional construct rather than a unidimensional, just equating it with pleasure. Oh, that's good. It is multidimensional, just like life. So that's that's really helpful. And you mentioned relationships several times. And I remember researching my first book on social nomics, and we might get into social media and how it relates or to happiness or, or unhappiness. Uh, but I remember uncovering a couple of studies that said the number one predictor of if you're going to live to be 100 or not is really, do you have a big social circle? Do you have existing relationships? So you've mentioned relationships several times. How do we cultivate healthy relationships since it seems like it's one of the keys to our ultimate happiness or the number one predictor of happiness yeah so yes it is the number one predictor of happiness and as you pointed out it's also the number one predictor of physical health and uh, conversely and, and there's a lot of talk about this uh, currently loneliness mm -hmm. doesn't only detract from happiness it also very much affects our physical health and and the question is uh, so how do we cultivate healthier, um, healthier relationships? You know, for um, many uh, thinkers and, and even researchers in the, in the field of relationships, it's about uh, attaining uh, uh, validation or giving validation or being uh, the receiver of validation from the other. And yeah, validation is nice and it, and it matters. And yes, it's important to some extent, but even more important when it comes to cultivating relationships is personal development. Because if we are to cultivate healthy relationships, healthy long-term intimate relationships, 
the first relationship we need to cultivate and is the one with ourselves. So focusing on personal development, on growing, on learning, that will indirectly also affect our relationship with others because we become more interesting to ourselves. We also become more interesting to others. We become more curious of others when we continuously study and learn ourselves. Um, so personal cultivation is, uh, and again, I didn't invent this. This was talked about uh, a few years uh, before me by Confucius, specifically 2,600 years ago, uh, where he talked about personal cultivation being the foundation of, uh, of healthy relationships, introducing kindness and gener generosity. So imagine this, you know, Eric, you go into a conversation. Um, one way to go into a conversation is just, you know, going to the conversation, no, no premeditated uh, ideas or thoughts. Another way is to think, how can I bring kindness into this conversation? Mm -hmm. How can I help uh, the other, you know, feel good um, uh, about themselves? Or how can I learn from the other person? Um, and if you come in with these ideas, that immediately elevates the um, the conversation. And of course, it will improve the relationship. No, I love it. I love it. And we always talk about the questions are the building blocks of great relationships, showing curiosity, interest. And so, and then self-servingly that's going to make you happier so you're making that person happy which inversely makes you happy so I, I love that approach and you know um there is a very clear distinction in our culture between uh, selfishness and selflessness you know and selfish i'm just thinking about myself self uh, uh selfless i'm just thinking about the other this distinction is unhealthy it's unhealthy uh for, um, for relationships, it's unhealthy for happiness. Instead of thinking about selfish or selfless, we need to think about self-full. Self and being self-full is about uh, um, doing things that will contribute to my happiness and doing things that contribute to the other's happiness. Well, that's great. So self-full. So something that I'm going to drive happiness, but also it's going to help the other person as well. That's good. And it's unhealthy to think so binary, like selfless and, and selfish. selfish. So that's good. That's good. Really yeah. good. And as you spoke about, you know, this, this is what win-win relationships are all about. And it's the win-win relationships that are sustainable, that help uh, both uh, parties or all parties grow. And then... What what recently this might be a shift. I don't know. You hear like in business, a lot of people listen to this are, are entrepreneurs, is it's a dog eat dog world. Nice guys finish last. You know, I don't know if you've done studies on this. Is that true? Are those just platitudes or is it is the world shifted that actually most of the time I've interviewed famous and fantastic people like yourself, the reason they're at the top is they're actually good with people. They've got a good emotional EQ, emotional intelligence. Uh, rarely you run into someone that's that's kind of what you'd see in movies. But for the most part, I'd say 90% of successful people are actually really good with people and, and are happy. Yeah, so whether you look at it on the individual level or the organizational level, it's actually those who contribute to others who are the most successful. And I want to be more specific here and, and um, mention research by Adam Grant. Who, who did work on, um, on, on givers. And he mm -hmm. distinguishes between givers, takers, and matchers. You know, givers are the nice guys, takers, you know, are all about me. And the matchers are all about quid pro quo. And what he found is that the givers, on average, in general, are both the most successful and the least successful. And the interesting question is, what distinguishes the most successful givers from the least successful givers? Because both of them are generous and kind, and they listen, and they ask questions, and we like them. And yet, there are these two groups, the most successful and the least successful. And the main difference between these two groups is that the successful givers also give themselves, mm -hmm. whereas the unsuccessful givers neglect themselves. In other words, they're selfless 
as opposed to self full. So the win-win, giving yourself and giving others, is um, is not just the right thing to do morally. Also in terms of performance, it's the right thing to do. No, that's a that's a wonderful example. And yeah, Adam Grant's fantastic. And, and a lot of that research is in his book, Give and Take, for our listeners out there. So it's Adam Grant, Give and Take. And just to quickly summarize that, it was that the most successful people actually are givers, but then the least successful are givers because they give all the time, meaning they never take a time out for themselves. So that's a great, I love self full. That's just such a useful word, self full. So that's what we got to think about all the time is, is self full. Um, what, what advice have you been given in your life that you find yourself passing on the most? Um, you know, the advice that I think most of us would, would give the question, though, is do we apply it in our lives is, um, you know, spend quality time with your loved ones. Mm-hmm. Um, another uh, a- another piece of advice that most of us would, would give and yet very often forget is, uh, you know, be, be kind to others. Another piece of advice is appreciate, be grateful, don't take for granted. Now, I'm giving these examples, A, because there are important and they make a big difference in our lives but be because they're also um trivial easy and not implemented consistently you know if i ask you eric or anyone else for this matter do you want to appreciate your loved ones or do you prefer to take them for granted it's a rhetorical question you know no one would say yeah i want to take my loved ones for granted i've I've, you know i've had it with appreciating them no we all want to appreciate and yet and yet most people most of the time take the good things in general the good things in their lives for granted not because they're bad people not because we are uh, you know ignorant not because we don't know it's because we forget and therefore reminders are so critical in our lives you know listening to a podcast is a form of reminder Having a picture on the wall um, of uh, our family and our loved ones, that's a reminder. Wearing a bracelet that reminds us to be mindful or to be appreciative or to be kind, that's a reminder. Having our smartphone, you know, with send notifications about certain things that we want a reminder of, that's important. We want to surround ourselves with reminders of the best versions of ourselves. How do I want to be? How do I want to show up in the world? The reminders are critical for that. Man, it's so good. And it's funny because you're asking about the glasses before the show and a lot of superintendents had reached out. And so these school districts were wearing these green glasses as a reminder to be kind. And so to your point, it's how do I remind myself so I can be intentional each and every day and 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 I guess one of them you mentioned, which is probably good, it might be a great first step for all of our listeners out there, because there's so much helpful information that you're giving us. I think one good first step might be that you just write a post-it note on your mirror to set up, schedule 15 minutes, a half hour with a loved one or a friend. It could be a son, daughter, or a friend, because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. But what I'm hearing, which makes sense, is it's the unsqueaky wheel should get the grease. Don't take for granted the most important people in your life, your family, your friends, and that's self full because you're gonna help them by sitting down with them, but also that's the greatest key to unlock your happiness as well. Um, Now, some of the listeners might say, I know this, but I don't implement it, that the world comes at me. And so, and I think that's why you're saying you've gotta put these reminders in place, these guardrails, because otherwise you'll forget. Uh, exactly right. And I, I want to expand on it a little bit. You know, over the I've, I've realized uh, over the past few years that, you know, the, the basic truths and ideas of the field of happiness studies, again, they're straightforward. Uh, there's no rocket science here. Um, however, just the fact that people know them doesn't mean that they apply them. Just the fact that they understand them doesn't mean that they implement them consistently. And therefore, you know, I've... Um, um, been speaking a lot and writing a lot about what I've come to call the three R's of change. And the three R's, the first one is exactly reminders. 
you need reminders, you know, whether it's reminders on your wall, you know, that post-it note, or whether it's your smartphone, or whether it's your, um, you know, it's your, uh, a picture that, that you know, of, uh, of your grandmother who embodies kindness. Reminders, first of all. The second are repetition. It's not enough to just do it once or twice. So if you do a gratitude, if you have a gratitude practice, don't just do it today and tomorrow. Do it every night or do it once a week, but do it consistently. Why are why is the second R repetition so important? Because it's only through repetition that we get to the third R, which is rituals. Rituals are quite literally uh, deeply embedded neural pathways. So if we do something over and over again, we create a neural pathway that makes certain behavior or certain pattern of thought automatic, a habit. And in the words of John Dryden, the British uh, poet, again, hundreds of years ago, he wrote, we first make our habits and then our habits make us. We make our habits through rem reminders and repetition and they start to make us when they become rituals. Hmm. And this is how we introduce change in our life, whether it's, uh, whether it's um, becoming kinder on a consistent basis, whether it's being more appreciative, whether it's exercising regularly, whether it is um, thinking more positively and fondly, whether it's uh, our, uh, about ourselves or about others. It's reminders, repetition, and rituals reminders repetitions and rituals i love it now some people's ritual unfortunately and, and i wrote a book on social dynamics going back 12 years ago telling people to get into social media and then businesses really but then all of a sudden people got too far into it uh, especially teens and there's correlating now that there's teen suicide associated with when instagram became very popular especially on the female side um, of things with teenagers committing more suicides especially on the female side now I think long term, I think these tools are good because it allows us to connect with people. And, and that's, but sometimes you go through these bumps and these are big bumps right now. So in my mind, I think they should be age gated, which is crazy coming from the person that wrote social nomics, but hey, maybe we should age gate these things. Uh, but this is a longer conversation. Hopefully we can have you on, but social media and happiness, big debate right now. Do you think it should be age gated? I mean, what are your thoughts on social media, especially when it comes to teenagers? Yeah, I, I think it should be gated in general, which which means age gated. It also means time gated. So to limit the amount of time that kids or adults uh, engage in social media, because, you know, what is social media? Social media, and you, you said it yourself, it's a tool and it's a very powerful tool. You know, electricity is a tool. It's a very powerful tool. Is it good or bad? Well, it depends Electricity is great because it allows us now to to have this conversation, uh, and 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 it it uh, powers a life support system. Electricity is also bad if it you know electrocutes an innocent person. It depends what we use those tools for, and again the key here is to use rather than to be used, or even worse to be abused by by them. And right now, too many people spend too much time uh, on social media. And we know that there are no substitute for our social needs. Yep. Having said that, there are also extremely powerful tools for getting important messages out there for connection. So we need to go back to using them rather than to be used by them. And for that, yes, I think we do need some gates, some limitations, some restrictions that we impose on ourselves or if we're parents, on our children. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like analogous to the bike. Like for many years, we rode bikes without helmets. Then we realized, wait, these kids should have helmets on. Same holds true for social media, that a bike's good, but you need to have some safety guards in place, uh, like a helmet. It's interesting that China's almost taken a lead on this, that they've recently come out. And so if you're 16, 18, you can only use social media tools between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., then it's shut off, and you can only use them for two hours. So. Uh, very fascinating times that we live in. And speaking about fascinating, it's incredible what you've built when you think about the Happiness Studies Academy. Um, so 
tell us what you're excited about when it comes to Happiness Studies Academy. I know it's the first place in the world you can get, I believe, a master's degree in happiness. So if you don't mind going into what's got you excited and all the great work you're doing with the academy. Yeah, so what, what really excites me is the fact that, you know, we have students from more than 85 countries um, taking our certificate program. We have uh, uh, many students who enrolled in in uh, the MA in Happiness Studies. We're now putting together uh, both a PhD and a BA in Happiness Studies. So we're really creating uh, uh, an ecosystem um, around the uh, the study of well-being. And our goal is, uh, well, it's, a, it's, it's both increasing one's own level of happiness and helping others increase their levels of happiness. So again, it's uh, spreading selfless in the world. I love it. Spreading selfless. Please check out Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar and all his amazing work. And remember that it's about reminders, repetition, and rituals. And it's okay if you have that unhappiness creep in. That's part of life. You've got to kind of go into that to get through it faster. So it's so good. That was a couple key learnings for me. Uh, and hopefully we can have you back on the show because we only scratched the surface here. So it's just just incredible. But I can't thank you enough uh, for your time. How can people learn more about you? Where can they find you? Well, they can uh, go on my website, which is talbenshahar, all one word, dot com, or happinessstudies.academy. Happinessstudies.academy. Wow. And it never goes out of style. So thank you for making me happier today. And and my daughter's going to get a big kick out of listening to this as well, as well as all of our listeners. It's the one thing that everyone wants. Like it's a topic that everyone wants more of is they want to be happier. So that's fantastic. Thanks for helping us unlock that today. Thank you, Eric, for all that you do. 